Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and I played The Outer Worlds. This is my brutally honest opinion. Now, for starters, number one, Private Division flew me out. Big thanks to them. Number two, what I played was not the final build, aka not the game that we're receiving on launch day. Number three, there is over an hour of The Outer Worlds gameplay on my channel right now without any commentary so if you'd like to watch that develop your opinion on the title and then come back to this video and contribute in the discussion you can do so i'll have it linked in the description for you now it's not much of a secret this is my most anticipated game of the year from the outside looking in it seems like a haven for rpg lovers such as myself now was that the case when i played it well that's where my brutally honest opinion comes in now brutally honest opinion does not entail negativity but rather i am not influenced by the free flights the hotels and so on. I'm grateful for the opportunity, do not get me wrong, and these trips are one of my favorite aspects of the job I have, but I serve my audience first. You guys are the reason I'm there, so you are the priority. With that said, here you are, ladies and gentlemen, all the good and bad from my time with my most anticipated game of 2019. It started off with Obsidian giving us what they defined as a quote, general character, end quote, build to play as. This means my character didn't really specialize in anything. I was given a jack of all trades, master of none build, which in the deepest of RPGs can lead to you missing out on more than you think because you spread yourself too thin. Now, while I didn't engage in any main story content here, I want to reserve this section, the story section, for my experience with questing, world building, NPC interaction, and so on. What really I feel counts in a role-playing title. My adventures began on Monarch, aka the failed attempt of terraforming by the board in the Outer Worlds. The first town I entered was Fallbrook, and immediately I fell in love with the environmental design. It was as if little lamplight from Fallout 3 had met the Wild West. This location was cozy, but it was also oddly silent for a town with such a boastful population. Whether I was walking by two NPCs or entering the local bar, things felt strangely quiet. There wasn't any ambient music going on or ongoing conversation with passersby, just my footsteps and some minor background sound to keep it from being entirely mute. Now this is something that would be consistent throughout my entire experience and nag at me a little bit. However, aesthetically speaking, this town oozed inspiration, which considering this is Obsidian's dream game, it seems rather fitting. It was dimly lit, had a drab personality to it, some of the locals would be leaning against buildings glaring at you as you walked by, and this led me to my first NPC encounter, Nelson Mason. Nelson Mason, decked out in a sketchy stash and a bowler hat, is the local drug dealer who uses Sprats, aka mutant bunny looking creatures, to carry the drugs for him around town as a cost cutting move. Except now in this quest you have to go find the missing drugs because a brilliant idea like that could never go wrong. Off I go, only to learn that the Sprats ain't these drugs go figure and they're tucked away in their, uh, fecal matter, we'll say. Did you find them? Tell me you found my dr I mean my Sprat carriers. Wonderful. Anyway, this highlights the storytelling vibe that Obsidian brings to the table. And no, I'm not metaphorically saying it's poop. It's a legitimately funny game, and I usually save that rare praise for a game like, we'll say, South Park. But what's here is special. Hearing characters yell, oh, law and frustration, subtly highlighting how their entire world is a business, or threatening people with a laminated lawsuit instead of just standard paper, makes this wacky universe become, in some odd way, believable. Comedy isn't the only way that this game thrives. The serious moments are equally as sharp. Learning who the mastermind of Monarch is and how they finagled their way into a subdued place of power was an immediate standout to me. Coupled that with strong voice work, loads of dialogue options, NPC interjections, and the conversations in this game are easily the best part of it in my opinion. Pounding through terminals for additional hidden tidbits is also here and will be familiar to fans of the Fallout franchise. Since it's not the only form of storytelling, but rather serves as topping to your lore pie, we'll say, I find this both acceptable 
and exciting. Information really is the name of the game here because one of my very quest rewards was an info broker who unveiled plenty about Monarch and the board as well as helped out Nioka, one of my companions. While it may seem minor, I find that that quest reward really serves as an exclamation point for what this experience is all about. I also investigated what was a deep reputation system in the game, boasting tons of factions or groups of people. They were organized by primary and secondary, likely meaning the former will represent main story slash significant groups of people, while the latter is reserved for tinier quests and crops of civilization. This made me ecstatic because nothing pumps me up more than a game that focuses on reactions from the characters and groups of people that you're interacting with, and then statistically represents that so you know right where you're at. It reminds me of, you guessed it, Kotor where you had the light to dark side bar that represented where you were at the force and how your character would be perceived by others, whether he was brooding because he was on the dark side or he was standing there looking into the sun practically because he was on the light side. A large chunk of my playthrough was actually spent going through Nioka's companion side quest. What concerned me about this was not Nioka at all. Her quest about avenging a fallen group of mercenaries and giving them a proper send off was rather intriguing. However, it was the second companion with me, Parvati. Now this is an assumption, mind you, but one I would consider safe. Nioka was full of new dialogue, trees to go down, and quests to explore. Meanwhile, Parvati was seemingly out of interactions to be had. She'd chime in while exploring or in conversation, but when I had personally interacted with her, there was nothing there. The reason I find this concerning is because I worry that once you finish a companion quest line, that they essentially shut down. I attempted to solve this mystery by completing Nioka's companion quest line, but that took us back to the Halcyon colony, which was not accessible in the demo build. I was personally playing. I do remain unsure if my assumption is correct, but it did leave me a little worried, not because I was expecting endless interaction, but rather that after I finished quests, I could stop, catch up, and hear their thoughts on what had occurred recently, something that I would hope would be in a deep RPG like The Outer Worlds. So to wrap up the story segment, I do want to mention one neat thing I realized. Every now and then, like I do at most of these events, I take a look around at the people who were playing and seeing what they were doing and kind of inspecting their experience. I was amazed to notice that all of them were doing something completely different despite us all playing the same build, and most of it was stuff I had not done yet. Even after the fact, when I discussed with various members of the press and other YouTubers, we all had fresh experiences that unfolded differently. This is going to be the type of game where you and I will walk out with vastly different experiences and then can blow each other's mind in a discussion. I found while playing that some conversation options were grayed out too, which could serve as an incentive for me to hop in for multiple playthroughs to see how different character interactions pan out with different skill sets. Now, let's move over to the gameplay section a little bit. The story, writing, world interactions and so on really take the cake when it comes to the Outer Worlds, but I don't find the gameplay being sacrificed for that level of quality, which is great to know. For starters, the shooting in this game I would rank better than Fallout 4 ever so slightly. Now I know Fallout 4 is not this top tier shooter, some of you may just had a little vomit come up in your mouth, but I view it as a compliment, especially as I recently just acquired the Platinum Trophy for Fallout 4, meaning the shooting gameplay is still relatively fresh in my mind. Now while shooting is above average as far as I'm concerned, the main Melee felt especially weak. Upon striking, smashing, and slashing enemies, the reactions to this damage felt off is the best word. I'd slash an enemy in the back with a razor sharp poison blade only to see them continue jogging along without so much as a stagger and only sparks flying off the blade. The gore slash dismembering is somewhat there, but don't expect something on the level of the bloody mess perk from Fallout where your foes will burst hilariously into different little bits. All that aside, I feel the melee needs a little oomph and a smidge more range as well. For me to connect a blow, I felt as if I had to be right on top of someone, but with that said, I was quite surprised at the variety of weapon models I was provided with. Fortunately, Obsidian seemingly saved the armor for the color palette swaps, which I found smart because this is a first person experience that can't be switched to third person. However, you can customize your companions with weapons and armor of your choosing that best fits their build so you will be able to see the armor on them. Now I struggled quite a bit with the HUD when it came to swapping out weapons where it was at the point I started to think that the menu may have been glitching out a little bit. I'm seriously like, trying to equip weapons on a third or second option in the Hot Wheel 
just wasn't working. You don't have to do all the work though, considering there are companion abilities, which are way more helpful than expected. Parvati's ability to slam people with a hammer and knock them all over, or with Nyoka raining laser hell down on her foes can serve as a deadly combo. Each ability stops for a quick, we'll put it in quotes, cutscene, so to say, which I think in an extensive playthrough can cut away from some of the action and lose that cinematic feel I believe it's trying to bring. That being said, it made me excited for a leader playthrough where I can send my companions out to do all the work because they're actually competent. When you're not shooting, you're exploring. The Outer Worlds is semi-open and exploration is reminiscent of KOTOR 2 just as Obsidian said, meaning it's more condensed yet packs value in every corner of that space. You can enter plenty of locations, but when I did go into Fallbrook, I noticed a lot of small buildings I couldn't enter. The game is far prettier than I expected, featuring a lovely color mix. It's not limited to that, but the lighting and the textures were also solid. The lighting really shined in Fallbrook. I'm super happy that this was the first town I chose to go to because I need to emphasize one more time how neat this place was. Now you can go all over the map and you can check out various locations. I entered caves that were off the beaten path and discovered different quest lines. And on top of these good looks and explorations, the world was surprisingly vertical. The Outer Worlds boasts plenty of tall structures and hills in its locale, which aided the exploration. I noted one location I cleared out that some nearby NPCs actually occupied when I killed everyone and they were standing outside hesitant to go in but once i had taken care of everything it actually was something that became populated now i don't think this is something that's going to be consistent in the experience where every place you clear is going to fill up but i thought this was neat given the context of the quest i was pursuing speaking of which I didn't encounter any places that served as just a shooting gallery. Granted, I played for an hour and a half, but every location had a story or a quest tied to it, which I personally found extremely relieving. This is something we've all been looking forward to. The tactical time dilation, AKA Outer Worlds version of VATS, as far as I'm concerned, was far more useful than I had expected. I have been around the FPS block, okay, ladies and gentlemen, so I had been semi-ignorant in assuming that this would be a mechanic reserved for those who loved RPGs, but maybe aren't ace at shooters, which is fine. However, the status effects that apply when shooting a body part using TTD added a layer of strategy to battles. I found a Mega Manta Queen, which was aggressive and could damage me pretty good until I used the TTD and shot it in the face to apply a blind status effect on it. From there, it staggered and seemed pretty confused as to where it was walking in a diagonal line. Another layer of strategy that was presented to me was when I was crawling through a building and found a terminal that let me vent oxygen out of the entire room. It was easy to miss and I had already got rid of most of the enemies, but it was awesome that it was there and it reminded me of actually in the first KOTOR game, I know you guys can clearly tell I love KOTOR, where you're able to clear out the room of Sith troopers and droids on the Endar Spire when you use the terminal behind the door and you wipe out the whole room that way. Now, in the moments of respite and recovery, you'll come across vending machines that provide all types of useful resources like crafting objects and healing items. If your hacking ability is a 20, you can break into the vending machine and sell to it, getting rid of excess junk and items to become more rich and fuel the corporate overlords that you're trying to overthrow. Now, I didn't get to tinker much with the crafting system. I only got to add a couple of mods to weapons, but there wasn't anything especially stand out here. So to conclude everything, after my session with the Outer Worlds, I put the controller down, I walked out of the room, found some of the buddies of mine at Obsidian, and I told them this, quote, this is a dangerous game, end quote. I can see myself sinking tons of hours into this game, experimenting in multiple playthroughs with multiple play styles. When this one arrives, all I can say is goodbye life. Now, all excitement aside, the buggy menus, companion shutdowns, weak melee combat, and overall mute towns have left me a little concerned in certain aspects, but this experience provided me with exactly what I would expect from an Obsidian game. Excellent role playing, top tier writing, familiar quirks, except when it comes in a package with sharper shooting, which is something that Obsidian's never been strong with. I'm crossing everything I have that when I get my hands on the full game, it continues to deliver on everything I loved in my experience when I went out to California to play this game. So that will conclude my brutally honest opinion for the Outer Worlds, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for giving me your time if you listened this 
deep into the video. If you're looking for more Outer Worlds content, you are in the right place. Subscribe for more, be a part of the show. We got a lot of exciting things coming on. August is my month. That's all I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen. So be excited, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Outer Worlds in the comments down below. So do fire away, ladies and gentlemen. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below, along with my Patreon. Do consider supporting that as it fuels all of the content I create here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.